the past couple decades, Korean new wave cinema has captivated international audiences with films that redefine genre and comment on important social issues. <laughs> it's director Bong Joon-ho who now leads the charge, setting an unprecedented amount of international attention with his 2019 thriller comedy social drama, Parasite. But it's not an adaptation, so we can't talk about it on this show. We can talk about his 2013 sci-fi action drama comedy. God, there's a lot of stuff. Snowpiercer. The premise of a super train carrying the last of mankind is derived from the French graphic novel Le Trans Personnage, originally published in 1982. Creators Jacques Loeb and Jean-Marc Rochette satirize modern society with an emphasis on the fragility of our ecosystem. Bong Joon-ho, however, leans more heavily into themes of social inequality. It's this thematic shift that dictates the majority of the changes in the adaptation. So how does Bong Joon-ho translate a French sci-fi about ecology into an action thriller about class? Well, grab yourself a protein snack and prepare to get spoiled because it's time to ask. What's, what's the, the difference? Oh, I, I can, did you want to go? Oh, you don't mind? No, I, you I can, can go. What's, what's the, the difference? difference? Both the book and the movie start with some backstory. The frozen Earth is a result of chemical CW7, but Bong Joon-ho deviates from the book when he reveals CW7 was an attempt to reverse global warming. In the book, CW7 is theorized to have been a weapon. It was a tool in humanity's struggle for dominance over the Earth, so the book is critical of war. How the fight over resources affects the social order. Both mediums divvy up the train into a class system, but they look very different. The train in the comic is separated into three classes. Bong Joon-ho's train, on the other hand, is a two-class society, the wealthy class at the front and the poor class in the tail. Based on the Indian caste system, a person's social place is preordained and cannot be changed. I belong on the head. You belong on the foot. Yes, so it is. The entire first act is set in the tail end where the people are used as resources for the upper class, and any dissent is dealt with inhumanely. However, the book rarely shows the tail end or its people. The first class cut all communication with the tail long ago, fearing that they may take more resources by force. But while the book's third class may not be the subject of oppressive dismemberment, the main characters do suffer the indignity of being shaved bald, since poor people are thought to be riddled with disease. Uh, this is boosh. So, by redirecting the focus from ecology to class, Bong Joon-ho sets the stage for a story about revolution. Then, he fills it with an ensemble of eclectic characters completely unique to the film. There's Mason, the sadist who maintains the caste system along with her team of enforcers, while the train's master, a man named Wilfred, operates unseen. Mr. Wilfred? Are you there? Meanwhile, a whole network of lower class rebels look to our protagonist, Curtis, to guide them to freedom. They've got no bullets! The main character in the book is Prolof, who is rather apathetic to the suffering of the tale. It's survival that drives him, not justice. His only ally is a naive social activist named Adeline who ties her fate to his. The antagonists are made up of institutions like the military, the government, and religious cults who would sacrifice the tail cars to secure their own safety. But Bong Joon-ho's characters all have unique motivations, which forge the path for a very different plot. In the movie, Curtis leads a violent escape from the tail, hacking their way through carriages like levels of a video game. His goal is to reach the engine and take control of the system. It's a straightforward journey from A to B. The book's plot is messier. Proloff escapes the tail by himself. He is then escorted to the front for an interview with the first class, where he learns that the train is pulling too much weight to endure. She can't take any more, Captain. Proloff and Adeline then uncover a secret plot to disconnect the tail in order to lighten the load. But when passengers start dying of a mysterious disease, mass panic turns violent as Proloff is hunted as patient zero. Many of the inner workings of the train are adapted straight out of the book, with the exception of the food. In the movie, the class divide becomes more clear when Curtis discovers their protein bars are made from insects, while the front of the train enjoys huge meat lockers and an aquarium full of seafood. In the comic, however, the menu is much more limited. The second class relies on a giant slab of artificial meat named Mama, while the elite first class enjoys fresh rabbit. Mmm, delicious. So while the privileged live much better than the tail, everyone still teeters on the brink of famine. Bong Joon-ho also diverges from the book when dealing with the subject of hedonism. Whether you're riding high at a rave party or chilled out in a coronal den, you know what you're not doing? Thinking about all the torture the poor people are enduring. This party ain't never stopping. While drugs certainly play a part in the comics, sex seems to be the more pervasive method of <clears throat> keeping busy. Get out of here. 
and thus we arrive at the final confrontation. In the movie, Curtis reaches the front of the train, but at the cost of every one of his friends. But reaching the engine room was never part of Proloff's goal. Instead, he's cornered at the front of the train, where he shoots out the windows, causing Adeline to die of exposure, while Proloff is rescued by Forrester, the reclusive engineer. Both mediums satirize God with the character of the train engineer, but Bong Joon-ho makes an amoral deity out of Wilfred, splitting his personality between a savior and the devil himself. Yes, he saved humanity with his train, yet he insists the suffering of others is necessary to ensure survival. Once inside the engine room, Wilfred tempts Curtis into taking his position. And now you have the sacred responsibility to lead all of humanity. Forrester couldn't care less about humanity. His top priority is the engine, lovingly named Olga. It is for her that Forrester saved Proloff, to keep her company after he's gone. Unlike Wilfred, Forrester is not a manipulator. He simply watches quietly from the sidelines as humanity indulges in depravity. Even though both Curtis and Proloff end up in the engine room, the outcome could not be more opposite. Yoda, take the fire. Curtis chooses to bring down the entire system, killing all on board except for two train-born children. The film ends with Yona and Timmy venturing out into a brave new world. Even if the entire system is destroyed, life goes on. In the book, it's the train that goes on after life has perished. Proloff wakes inside the engine room with Forrester where he watches impotently as the tail end is sacrificed and the upper classes all die from the mysterious disease. By the final frame, Proloff is the lone survivor on a train that will never stop. And that's the end of the line. Bong Joon-ho adapts the original premise into a story all his own, complete with the hallmarks of Korean cinema. Genre bending, rapid shifts in tone, and striking imagery layered with meaning. You could say Korean is the film's native tongue. The comic's tongue is pure French, but mostly the dirty words. It drips with decadence, vulgarity, and smut. It's bleak, and at times made me feel pretty ashamed of myself. I mean, what am I doing to help steer our world away from ecological disaster? I'm just sitting here making little videos for you to watch. <sighs> <sighs> wow, okay, well that's enough for this episode. Let us know what you think about Snowpiercer in the comments down below, and be sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more. Chronal? No, that, that's okay. Until next time. Chronal? Dude, get out of here. Chronal. You're bugging me.